Welcome to the rule of law in the new abnormal. Uh, my name's Ben Davis, and I'm your host today. I, instead of saying aloha, I'm going to say howdy, because I'm here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, so the topic today is uh, the rough side of the mountain, which is an old uh, gospel song. If you've never listened to it, please listen to it on YouTube, talking about coming up the rough, rough side of the mountain. And the idea today is to discuss a number of the things that are, seem to be kind of complex right now, uh, such as the uh, presidential uh, immunity decision of the Supreme Court, what's going on with the Democrats, uh, the elections in England and France, uh, some people feeling nervous about all the election stuff and all that or going through hard times. And uh, I'm really pleased today to be with my old friend, Elder Vernelia Randall, uh, who is Emerita Professor of Law uh, from uh, University of Dayton School of Law. Um, I taught at the University of Toledo, where I'm Emeritus too, so you got two Ohioans talking to you from Hawaii on a Hawaiian show. So I hope that you will uh, enjoy what we talk about, and I hope that at the end of this, um, you will have a little bit of, I would call the optimism of the people who in that gospel song, Rough Side of the Mountain understanding where you're at and there where you need to go okay so uh hello Vernelia how are you doing hi Ben how are you doing I'm doing fine thank you all right so let's maybe talk first uh for the everyone out there about the Supreme Court presidential immunity decision of uh July 1st okay so um just to give you a little background so the Supreme Court has basically said that the president is immune from criminal prosecution for core activities. And then for ones that are in what's called the outer perimeter, he's presumptively, he or she is presumptively immune. And uh, so the core official acts, the outer perimeter official acts presumptively, and then only for unofficial acts are they uh, possibly going to be criminally liable. I happen to have heard uh, Judge Luddig uh, retired from the Fourth Circuit uh, a few months, a weeks ago or a few months ago, speak on that topic. And he was quite candid in saying he had no clue how to distinguish between those three things. But now we have a Supreme Court that's made a decision that said that. So what do you think about that, Bernelia? Well, first of all, let's be real. Presidents haven't been uh, prosecuted for crimes, even when they committed overt crimes like Ronald Reagan and the uh, Iran Contra, or yeah, so 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 the whole idea that presidents are going to be prosecuted for for their activities is a farce. It comes up now with Donald Trump because he is being prosecuted. Uh, after in some ways, and so it they had to deal with it. I truly think that the the problem becomes, you know, if you have even the smartest person, you can be a dumb president, and if you're surrounded with people who have any inkling of uh, smarts, they will be able to make anything an official act. Right. Right. It, yeah. it, 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 whatever you define an official act is, is that it doesn't matter how we define an official act. We can make it narrow. We can make it broad. Uh, unless we list, unless unless the Supreme Court, our other courts start actually listing what is and isn't an official act. But even that won't work. Because a smart person will find a way to get a criminal activity fitted into an official act. And I forget whose uh, dissent said, yeah, this basically made it legal for a, per a president to commit all kinds of crimes and mm -hmm. in their own interest and then have it uh, not be be able to prosecute them because they do it as an official act. 
I noticed I, I skimmed over it. I have to admit that I didn't read the whole article. I was taking the, the military tried to write an article uh, saying basically how the military wouldn't be involved. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what you say. But yeah. all it would take is for them to find the right general to yeah. order the general to do it, so someone and the general do it. It, it, it. We could be in a situation where lower people end up being prosecuted for things. Yeah. Well, you know, that that a president can't be prosecuted for. You know, that hits on a number of 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 different points that uh, resonated in my head. One was, I remember doing some research for a former prosecutor named Vince Bugliosi, who wanted to prosecute George Bush for the war in Iraq in a California court, okay? So somehow he got my name and asked me to take a look at it. So I took a look at it, and it was a real hard thing for me in my head to imagine prosecuting a president because he'd never been done, or a former president, right? So the hypothetical I came up with in my head was that if the president of the United States was selling crack cocaine out of the Oval Office, could they be charged or even if they asserted that it was national security, all right? And that's the way I kind of freed my mind to start to think about it, you know, thinking about what's in the outer perimeter and what's within the core function, stuff like that. And I looked back a long time ago to a discussion that actually happened in Jefferson's cabinet about this, okay, where there were members of the cabinet who were saying, yes, the president is immune from criminal prosecution. And there were other members who said, no, no, the president is not immune. And one of the people who had been against that idea had said, you know, there seem to be some people in this cabinet who have some nostalgia for the leavened bread of monarchy, okay? And... This was a problem at the time. I mean, remember George Washington, they wanted to have a coronation for him. And he said, no, no, we're not going to do that. I'm just the president, remember? So, you know, looking at those kind of things, I said, okay, I guess the Supreme Court has just said that, yeah, a president is immune and decided that thing in a way that is uh, potentially really uh, far-reaching since, as you said, people who are smart can always come up with a core official act to, to for for anything that could go on, you know. Um, I mean, the the the, the most over, the national security. Hey, that by that that covers a wealth of sins. Yeah, to say yeah. That something's done in the inter and, and 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 it's important because the court gives deference to national security claims. At, yes. All the so time. The government claimed, hey, I did this. We did this because it was in the interest of national security. The court doesn't really dig into the truthfulness of that. As a matter of fact, that's how uh, the Japanese Americans end up being put into concentration camps in World War II because of. The, the whole national security claim and, yeah. and saying, well, you know, national security trumps anything else, even including the rights of a citizen to have due process, the rights of the citizen not to be to put into uh, a concentration camp. So it's the, the whole the thing is is, is that there's ways first of all an official act there's there's no doubt that people can find an official act to cover anything they want and then they can claim national security as a way to keep the courts from digging in deep yeah you know um one of the things that struck me also about this decision was um, I was just reading a book by a guy named O. John Rogie, who was a prosecutor during World War II 
of a bunch of Americans who were siding with the Nazis, you know, the, the America First folks. And there were a lot of members of Congress who were involved in supporting basically the Nazi view of things, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, but these were going after individuals. And uh, he wrote a, he went to Germany after the war. OK. And he looked at the Germans files on what they had about all these Americans. And he, he actually named 24 members of Congress who had been working with the, uh, the uh, pro-Nazi view, okay? Yeah. So anyway, he goes ahead, and he was the second prosecutor because some senator had gotten the first one jettisoned from DOJ, and he um, tries to do the prosecution. And in the middle of the prosecution, Supreme Court makes two decisions on the sedition laws that really narrow the grounds under which he can prosecute. And so he has to say reluctantly in his report that he did in 46 or 47, I can't go ahead with these prosecutions in light of these two decisions. Yeah. And so when, when I saw this presidential immunity thing, I thought of Jack Smith, I was like, nothing new under the sun. Right. Now, the thing that was interesting is this guy, Rogi, he wanted to have published for the American people his 477-page report on what he'd found with the Germans and who was naming names. It got buried until 1961, but he finally got it out, okay? Yeah. So the, I guess the, the point I'm trying to say is that there's really nothing new under the sun of the Supreme Court stepping in like this. The only question I had is maybe this is a gift that's maybe too much of a gift for because there are a lot of people who say, well, we have a president with that kind of power. We make sure we don't have somebody like Donald Trump in there because we, we're fearful of having a president with that kind of power. Or do you think it's going to go the other way? Well, I think, first of all, there is there there is a lot of fear from having Donald Trump, okay? And I think that the immunity thing will drive some people to vote for Biden. But Biden's competency will drive a lot of people to stay home. That mm. people people will say, I can't vote for Trump, but I can't vote for Biden. And their fear of Trump is not enough, or they don't understand enough. Or I, I find myself in the odd situation because all my life, all my voting life, I have adopted, I don't vote for the lesser of two evils. That the, the new people would say, I, I would articulate why I wasn't going to vote for what other people see as a good candidate. And they would say, yeah, you're right, but it's the lesser of two evils. And I would say, yeah, evil's still evil. <laughs> and, and, and I wouldn't vote. I, yeah. I, and I can identify, I identify strongly with people who are not going to vote for Biden and mm -hmm. who are not going to vote for Trump. And the question is, who's going to be hurt most by that? Right. And I think Biden's going to be hurt most by that. Uh, you know, I, think that it, I think the people who are planning to stay, who are going to stay home are going to be people who are on the line with Biden, but have, are calling into question his competency. Right. And, well, he, mm -hmm. and, and he definitely has problems. And my problem, I'm churning in my stomach about what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. I, to, to tell you the truth, I could sit it out. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't want Trump but the idea of me casting a vote for someone who's mentally incompetent turns my stomach because then I have to live with that. Right. Live with the idea that my vote put them in office. And someone says, well, if you don't vote, that put them in the office. Yeah, but it wouldn't be my vote. And so I think there's going to be a lot of people who yeah. had that belief system. Well, you know, I saw somebody who did a nice uh, summary of it as the old man and the con man, okay? That's the, the choice between those two. 
And yes. um, I'm probably the only person in America who didn't actually watch the debate because I had to get up at 4.15 in the morning the next day. Um, but, you know, I've watched all the stuff since then and all the hand-wringing. And, uh, and I saw some of the videos. And, you know, what struck me. And I, I go back, I think, to Gerald Ford against Carter, where in the first debate, the incumbent president tends to have a bad debate, okay? They just tend to. I mean, I can think of so many. It was like Reagan. I remember Reagan, they talk about him being too old. And then there was uh, uh, um, Carter against Reagan. Then there was uh, Bush. They said, let Bush be Bush. I remember that thing. And I mean, anyway, so, so I said, okay, well, apparently he had an awful one. He had an awful debate, right? Um, and then the question, I see all these people who are sitting there saying, oh, well, we got to have him step down. Or not all of them, but a lot of people mumbling around there, right? You know, and I'm like, wait a minute. And the DJ D.L. Hooley, Hooley made this comment recently. He said, there's no president who has walked away from the bully pulpit and their incumbency and won an election. You know, and that you know, walked away from it and had somebody win that election and replace them. I've seen people re re propose, well, Kamala Harris. I know people who are saying they're not going to vote for Biden because of Kamala Harris, and I, that's a whole nother story there. I think the I've been watching Biden for, because pay, people have been watching Biden with rose-colored lens. They see what they want to see, mm -hmm. but what we what 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 we've seen is Biden has deteriorating mental cognitive stuff. And one of the things I find really weird is that you, you, you hear that George Clooney uh, wrote an essay calling for him to step down. Something he said in his essay that people have just ignored, and that's because they don't want to deal with it. He said, that the Biden he saw on the stage was the same Biden he saw three weeks earlier. So this isn't this isn't a stage performance issue. This, it was scheduled too late. I agree with them. They talk about how he does so well up in the day. Yeah, because that's what dementia does. Up in the day when you first get up and your brain is all full of nice blood and working real well, you think real well, but as the day goes longer, you get tired. Can we have a president who can't function after eight o'clock? Well, the question, I'd put it the other way. Remember when uh, 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 when Hillary Clinton was, was running against Obama, she said, who do you want to take the call at three o'clock in the morning, right? You know, And I was like, I certainly don't want Donald Trump making that taking that call at three o'clock in the morning. Do I and want, I don't Biden, want take... Biden either? Right. That, that's it's the like... problem. That's the problem for the election. It's yeah. not, it's that you are not gonna convince that there is a huge number of people who are not going to be convinced by the fact that Donald, Donald Trump is evil. Right. What they're going to see is a president that is handicapped. You know, and that's true. And you know what thing that really strikes me is, I mean, we had the NATO summit, right? And uh, the NATO summit, from what I heard, from what I read, you know, was that, you know, the, the heads of state were like setting it up so NATO is uh, Trumpified, right? So they pass things over to the Secretary General of NATO that the U.S. used to do and things like that. That's what they've been preparing in case that happens. But they, they said they can live with Biden, but they are scared of Trump coming in, right? And then one of the guys that struck me is the head of Hungary, Viktor Orban. He's the head of Europe for the next six months, right? Okay, under this, they turn things around among the heads of state. First thing he does, he flies to Moscow to talk to Putin. Then he comes back from Moscow, and then he's here for the NATO thing. And guess where he's heading to next? mar -a lago and I look at that and I said, there's some shady stuff. There's some shady stuff. But anyway, 
Democrats are having their meltdown. My personal feeling is, you know, but it's Biden's the win or lose at this point. Well, first of all, I don't think it's his for win or lose. That's like asking a handicapped person to run a race. Uh, well, Trump is disabled too, but yeah. he's <laughs> he's disabled in a different way. The problem, and it just, I mean, who knows? They're both running a race for who will be go be most mentally incompetent because Trump is mentally incompetent too. Yeah, I know. The problem, I know, I mean... because the problem is, is that his personality covers it better. His being able to schedule his meetings covers it better. President Biden can't do the same kind of cover because he's got to show up for shit. Right. And, 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 and he can't. I, I think what, if Biden wants to convince me and other people, he's got to start doing nighttime interviews. He's got to start doing nighttime speeches. He's got to start getting out and being on at night. Like the State of the Union he did. Where yes. He was on fire, right? Yes. He was so on fire. They should just, so, they should give him the drugs they gave him for the State of the Union. No, okay. I I don't know what drugs if any he I gave. Him, but, I don't know which one, which one had more but, drugs. But anyway. State of the Union is is evidence. I think that the problem we don't understand is he's got a progressive disorder, and so he was on fire to State of the Union because he was actually better at that time yeah, than he could be. is at this time, and. The other thing he could do is do a cognitive test and a physical exam and release the information. Okay. So let me take this another way is that, I don't know, and this is when the European Union uh, elections happened, there was all that rise of the extreme right votes in different European countries. And everybody was saying, oh, this was like uh, something that is uh, suggesting what's going to happen in the United States, right? So then we have the UK vote, which is a landslide for labor, right? And then you had the French that had their first round where the, the party got the most uh, votes was the extreme right. And in the second round, the, the, the left and the center folks came together and blocked them, right? And I've been looking for people to say, oh, the left is winning in the UK and France. Maybe that's an argument for the United States. I'm not seeing much of that. Do you notice that? Well, yeah, because the left ain't winning in the UK. My son is a British citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, he okay. became a citizen a while ago. And, the, and yeah, it ain't the Conservative Party, but the Labour Party is at best a centrist Democrat party. It's okay. a leftist party. And so it would it would be a mistake to compare it to the left. It's better to compare it to a center Democrat, at least according to my son. I don't okay. know. Okay. Okay. So okay. the thing the, the 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 France thing I think is really an example of why we need multiple parties. Mm. Because the the reason that they would that would not have happened if they didn't have multiple parties and require a, a second election if no one got over fifty percent, okay? Yeah. Because so, the the conservative party won the first round. Mm -hmm. They would have been essentially Donald Trump. Right. They they got. 40 something percent. And because they only had to win the first elect first round, they would have been in. And yeah, we would do what made France different is France has a different political system. They have more than one party and they require another election if nobody gets over 50 percent. We have a fucking winner take all, no matter how small that amount is. So, you know, you got 48, 
nine percent, you you get to take it all. So you know, one thing that I didn't see in the commentaries from the United States because I lived in France seventeen years, right? Yeah, and that in that French system, it's like the first round you vote with your heart, second round you vote with your head. That's the way it works in, in, in the way that people look. And you know, one of the things that really struck me is that the French have a long history of both collaborationist and resistance, right? And it, and that's been a thing that goes back, you know, through World War II, and that thing came out again to me. Which is that? Nah, we're not doing that thing, man. We're not doing that, that that extreme right thing again. Wait, there may be people who are suffering and they want, you know, their numbers come up. But when it came to the crunch, no, we can't have this here. What I found very interesting about the French election is the willingness they formed a new party. Yeah, a yeah. new party in a week. In a week. And all of these other people gave up their gave, gave up and 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 said, "Okay, I'm taking my name off the election. I'm taking." Yeah, if I if I came in number I three, I can't even imagine that happening in the United States. I, I can't. I can't imagine people say, "Let's form a new party." And we first of all, the Democrats and Republicans have shut out new party, so that that's a fantasy to even think that a new party could come up. But yeah. if a new party could come up, can you imagine Biden yeah. saying, yeah. you know, I only have I only have a 37% approval rate. I'm going to go with this new party and let them run somebody new. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that made me think of something. I don't know why it popped in my head. Did you see this I think it's in Texas and in Oklahoma that you can go to a vending machine now and some stores and buy bullets. Have you seen that? 24-hour bullets? No, but that doesn't surprise me about Texas. I, was, I, I, I read that. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Being born and raised in Texas, it doesn't surprise me at all. Talking mm. about, the, since you brought up the state of Texas, I want to bring up the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. I, I think Florida is a laboratory of what happens when you get a MAGA governor, a MAGA Senate, and a MAGA House. Mm -hmm. They have been passing bills right and left. And I have to say, I think I said this earlier, I'm jealous. Because all my all my voting life, I went into fucking Democrats. When they had vote all three parts of government, I wanted them to get in and just pass laws and right and left. But they're always being so strategic. But not these people. They're just passing everything, even insane things. And the most recent thing they passed is a law forbidding cities from requiring employers to give heat relief. God. I mean... No water. You can't require... No, you can't... The cities can't require employers to give heat relief of any kind. Not only that, the cities can't require employers to educate their employees on how to avoid heat stroke. And can you imagine people working in this? Yeah, place? right. My son says, and I didn't really realize this, that this is more of a slap. This particular law is a slap at Democratic cities. Florida is a blue state, but it's got all of the big cities, for the most part, are Democrat. Right, right. For all those folks who espouse their religious faith and, you know, their humanism and all that, that's about, about the cruelest thing I could think of somebody saying, that you can't even warn people about their risks. I mean, I, I've had kind of, not maybe all the way to heat stroke, but I've had some moments where, you know, 
it's difficult. And the idea that an employer couldn't even say anything about that shows a kind of perversion, I would say. Just a perversion in, 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 in the minds of these people. Part of the thing is uh, it's a tribal attitude, basically. The city, and I, I agree with my son Shaka on this. This is about hurting the democratic democratic cities because and keeping them from doing stuff that they want to do. Right. And even if it has, is even if it doesn't hurt the cities directly, because there's no the cities weren't passing laws saying that they were going to give out water. They were right. just going to pass. They just any. They don't want, they want to be counter to anything uh, a democratic city was going to do. And this isn't new. I experienced the same thing in Ohio. Mm. Uh, when, uh, you know, the when there was all this funding, oh, my brain's going weak, uh, Predatory funding of housing. Right, right. The the yeah the uh, the not the the. There was a specific. Right, name. I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. Okay, so Dayton passed a, a Democratic city passed a law that was going to actually do something about it. Regulate what people who give out loans inside of the city had to do. Ohio passed a law saying that cities couldn't pass laws that like that. Yeah, yeah. Which would have been okay if they would have turned out and dealt with the problem, but they didn't. They weren't interested in fixing the problem. They just were interested in not having, because not having... Uh, democratic cities do it or do something like that. Uh, I think we've gone. Well, I just want to finish up here. I would just say, so are we on the rough side of the mountain right now, worse than before or about the same? Or maybe less than before? I don't know. It's not less than before. I think it's, I think I kind of feel for my kids because what has been unleashed is a racist and a more overt racist society than I lived through in um, in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 and possibly I think about this. I grew up in the Jim Crow South, and it may be a more overt racist society than that. Largely wow. because people, there is no real rules and rhymes or reason, and so. Anybody can do anything racist at any time. And you, you know, you, you, you know, how do you protect yourself from a, and this really happened, a, a fourth grader went to a city council meeting, a, a, a black fourth grader and a black fifth grader went to a city council meeting to advocate uh, for something in their school. What they are advocating for had nothing to do with race. As soon as they start talking, a woman on Zoom start calling them the N-word. Wow. Wow. And start, you know, and how do you protect your children? I mean, we were protected by keeping us away from white folks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do you protect your children when you can't keep them away from white folks. Well, that sounds to me like it's, uh, you know, certainly not better and probably worse. And it's not even compared to 70s and the 80s. Compared the to 70s thing, to 80s. The only yeah. thing I can think of is uh, there's a quote from a book by a guy named Hans Falada, Every Man Dies Alone. 
which is about a couple of ordinary Germans during the Nazi era who rebelled against Hitler in Berlin. And they went around and they wrote up little cards, right? Where they say, don't trust the Nazis. And, I, and they go into public places and when nobody was looking, they'd throw it down. <laughs> they, 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 did, they did about 140 of them, this couple. I mean, just ordinary working class folks, right? And uh, then the book uh, that this guy wrote were based on the true story because it actually has the, the Gestapo file. They got arrested, they got killed and all that. But the line in the book that I always love is that the line that says, the main thing is you fight back. The main thing is, comma, you fight back. And yeah. I just, that's the hopeful thing I would leave us with today is that, you know, the main thing is you fight back. Uh, you do the best you can. That's also part of that rough side of the mountain song. I'm doing the best I can. So on that note, we thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.